Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is hypersensitivity. Now this is a topic that is typically covered in great detail by immunology faculty in medical schools. So the focus of this video will be the intersection of hypersensitivity and pathology. And I hope to provide a, a framework so that you will be able to recognize hypersensitivity in its many manifestations in the diseases that you will encounter again and again throughout your medical career. So with that in mind, I will compare and contrast the different types of hypersensitivity. Now, hypersensitivity is immunologically mediated tissue injury that can be in response to exogenous environmental as well as endogenous self-antigens. And what hypersensitivity represents is an imbalance between the effector mechanisms of immune response and the control mechanisms that exist to limit that response. Hypersensitivity is associated uh, with a variety of genes, so we can have increased susceptibility based on genes that may be HLA or not HLA related. Now, there are multiple causes of hypersensitivity. We can see autoimmunity to self-antigens due to breakdown and self-tolerance. We can get reactions against microbes, such as an ex uh, excess response to a microbial antigen, or if that antigen is persistent, such as what we see in tuberculosis, or we can get hypersensitivity response to that. Uh, another example will be cross-reactivity between uh, a microbial antigen and a self-antigen. This is referred to as molecular mimicry, and an example of this is rheumatic heart disease. And finally, we can see an exuberant systemic inflammatory reaction that causes extensive tissue damage. This is uh, one of the effectors of COVID-19. And finally, we can get reactions against environmental antigens uh, that are typically harmless, and this can be things such as pollen or dust uh, leading to allergies. Now, there are four types of hypersensitivity. We have immediate, or type 1, antibody-mediated, or type 2, immune complex-mediated, or type 3, and cell-mediated type 4. This is a table from Robbins and Kumar, Basic Pathology, 11th edition. And while I'm going to work through the immune mechanisms in this video, I would encourage you to use this table uh, as a review uh, for your studies. Let's begin with type 1, or immediate hypersensitivity. And what type 1 hypersensitivity represents is an excess Th2 response, where we have a laboration of IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. These are going to result in the production of an IgE antibody and mast cell sensitization. Once that mast cell is sensitized and then we re-expose the individual to that particular uh, antigen, we will get two phases. One is the immediate response and then we can have a late phase reaction. This immediate response is going to unfold within minutes, 5 to 30 minutes, and is going to be set off by mast cell degranulation due to this uh, IgE uh, sensitization. With this degranulation, we're going to get the release of vasoactive amines and mediators that are going to cause vascular dilation, edema, smooth muscle contraction, mucus production, tissue injury, and inflammation. Now, over the next two to eight hours and evolving over days, we're going to have our late phase reaction, which involves neutrophils, eosinophils, and uh, lymphocytes, particularly of the Th2 subset. And we're going to get the elaboration of abundant cytokines that are going to contribute to this inflammation, tissue destruction, and mucosal epithelial cell damage. And examples of type 1 hypersensitivity include anaphylaxis, allergies, and atopic forms of bronchial asthma. So let's look at a figure that puts this all together. Here you can see we have our mucosa, and uh, this pollen molecule has landed here. It has been processed by a dendritic cell that presents it to a naive T cell. Now, for whatever reason, there are some antigens that tend to drive a Th2 response. So we have this Th2 cell, which is going to elaborate IL-4 and IL-13, which is going to drive our B cell uh, to class switch to IgE. We're also going to uh, be stimulating and recruiting our eosinophils with IL-5. Now, this uh, IgE-secreting plasma cell is going to begin producing IgE antibodies, and these IgE antibodies are going to uh, bind uh, to receptors on mast cells. This mast cell is now primed, so when we get repeat exposure to that allergen, that's going to cause this uh, cross-linking here and a mast cell degranulation. These mediators are going to be vasoactive amines and lipid mediators that will cause the immediate response. Uh, and then we will also get the cytokines for the late phase reaction. 
So we can actually visualize what we see here. This is just a graph showing our immediate reaction following allergen exposure and then our late phase reaction. But what we can see in the tissue, this is quite dramatic here. Here are our mast cells in the process of degranulating. You can see the little granules here. And you can actually see the response of these uh, uh, mediators in the edema. Notice this clear area here. This is caused by fluid, which is pushing apart the tissue. And then you can also appreciate how congested uh, this blood vessel is. It is absolutely packed with red cells, in part because the edema fluid has leaked out of this vessel. And then over time, we're going to get recruitment of eosinophils, which are part of this reaction. This brings us to our uh, next topic, which is type 2 or antibody-mediated hypersensitivity. And there are three ways uh, that antibodies can uh, be pathological or cause uh, damage. So let's look at the first. The, the role of an antibody, actually, what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to opsonize and cause phagocytosis. And that is what we see in an appropriate immune response. But in hypersensitivity, we're getting this in an inappropriate fashion. So what happens is, is our phagocytes are going to recognize the FC tails of our IgG, or they're going to recognize complement breakdown products to ingest opsonized particles. Again, what they're supposed to do, but we see that in, uh, in pathologic conditions when we have a transfusion reaction, uh, fetal immune hydrops, and there's a separate video on that uh, in detail, but I'll show you a figure from that in a moment, uh, as well as drug reactions. A second way that antibodies uh, can cause a hypersensitivity reaction is through creating inflammation. So this is in particular what we associate when we get antibody deposition on fixed tissues. And the classic example of this will be good pasture syndrome, and I'll show you an example in a moment. Once those antibodies deposit in fixed tissues, we're going to get uh, activation of complement by the classical pathway, which is going to recruit neutrophils and macrophages, resulting in the release of reactive oxygen species and neutrophil enzymes. And we see uh, this pathologic process in some types of glomerulonephritis, uh, as well as organ transplant rejection. And then the final uh, way that antibodies uh, can uh, cause disease is through antibody-mediated cellular dysfunction. So this is where they cause some sort of impairment without actually destroying the tissue. And two classic examples of this will be Graves' disease, in which we get antibodies to the thyroid-stimulating hormone receptor, which is found on follicle cells in the thyroid. When these antibodies bind to the receptor, they stimulate that cell to begin producing thyroid hormone. This is without the usual uh, signals that we're getting from the anterior pituitary gland, so we get excess uh, thyroid hormone production. We can also see uh, antibodies causing disease uh, when we look at pernicious anemia. And in this case, we have antibodies to intrinsic factor. And although uh, we're not actually damaging any cells, what happens is by uh, the antibodies uh, binding to intrinsic factor, we decrease the ability of the cells uh, to uh, absorb vitamin B12, which can lead to pathology. So let's look at each of these uh, different mechanisms. Here's our opsonization uh, and phagocytosis, a cell opsonized by antibody, recognized by a phagocyte and consumed. Or we have complement activation, the C3B opsonized a, a cell, which is again phagocytosed. This is uh, which we can see here. And an example of this, as I already mentioned, is immune uh, fetal hydrops. Uh, there is an entire video on this, but just to recap briefly, we have uh, a fetus with Rh positive blood cells with a uh, mother who is Rh negative. In that first pregnancy, she's going to uh, recognize this Rh antigen and develop IgM antibodies. By the second uh, or subsequent pregnancies, she will develop IgG antibodies that can cross the placenta and they will bind to the fetus's Rh positive erythrocytes. This is going to cause removal removal and destruction of their erythrocyte antibody complex, leading to high drops, which we can see here, as well as jaundice and carnicterus. Uh, the next mechanism we discussed was complement and FC receptor-mediated uh, inflammation. Uh, we can see here we have uh, a cell membrane, which has a particular antigen on it. We have antibodies that bind to it. This is going to uh, then be recognized by neutrophils, and neutrophils will release their enzymes, causing damage. We can also get complement binding, and these complement byproducts are going to uh, cause additional inflammation. Now, the classic example of this is going to be good pasture syndrome, and I want you to focus on this image on the left. 
This is a glomerulus. And what we see in good pasture syndrome is that the individual has antibodies to an antigen found in the glomerular basement membrane. And because that, um, that antigen is evenly distributed throughout that basement membrane, we have this smooth deposition of all of these antibodies, which we can recognize with immunofluorescence. Now we're going to contrast that to this, which is a lumpy, bumpy, granular appearance. We're going to talk about this when we talk about uh, immune complex mediated disease. But here is where we see those antibodies bind. They're going uh, to then uh, activate complement, and we're going to get uh, an attack and inflammation on this glomerulus. And then the uh, final uh, pathway that we discussed was antibody-mediated cellular dysfunction. This is showing here our antibody against the thyroid-stimulating hormone receptor, which is going to uh, be expressed by the thyroid epithelial cell. When this binds, it's going to act as if this were uh, the appropriate uh, ligand, causing the elaboration of thyroid hormones. And what we can see here is a thyroid, uh, this is covered in the autoimmune thyroiditis uh, video. This is uh, a thyroid that is very juicy and plump. Uh, and what we can see here histologically is that this uh, follicular epithelium is very revved up. It's getting this really profound signal to gener generate thyroid hormone. And so it is frantically consuming as much colloid as it can, causing these vacuoles as it is generating abundant uh, thyroid hormone. This brings us uh, to type 3, or immune complex mediated hypersensitivity. And the first step here is going to be the formation of immune complexes. And this will happen following uh, exposure of a protein antigen. Antibodies will be developed about a week later. And then these antibodies are going to bind to uh, this antigen in the serum, forming uh, antibody antigen complexes. Now, this is the important step here, is this deposition of immune complexes. Uh, and there are a variety of different um, uh, factors that account for this deposition. Uh, one of them has to be the uh, immune complex characteristics, and the other are local vascular uh, conditions. So when we talk about immune complex characteristics, obviously not all immune complexes uh, deposit in tissues and cause damage. And what is referred to in Robin's basic pathology is when you have excess amounts uh, of uh, an antibody antigen complexes. Uh, in other books, it refers to medium-sized uh, antibody antigen complexes. But the easiest way to think about this is that when you have antibody excess, then it's going to bind up that antigen and it will not be soluble and will cause uh, phagocytosis. If, on the other hand, we have excess antigen, we're going to uh, remain soluble, and these will not be efficiently cleared by the phagocytes in the spleen and the liver. So they continue to float in the blood until we get to an area where the vascular conditions are appropriate for deposition. And this is most typically going to be areas with a high filtration pressure, so the glomerulus of the kidney, or we can see this in the synovium. And that's why these tissues tend to be injured in immune complex mediated disease. So we're going to get uh, this immune complex mediated inflammation occurring at about 10 days. Uh, and this is going to be secondary to classical activation of complement through the IgG and IgM antibodies, resulting in fever, or urticaria, joint pain, and lymphadenopathy. And some classic examples are systemic lupus, erythematosus, and post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So let's take a look at how this happens in a nice figure from Robbins and Kumar, basic pathology. So here we have our blood vessel, uh, and we have our antigen, which is in circulation. Our B cell is going to uh, uh, become a plasma cell, generating these free antibodies that will bind uh, to these antigens in circulation. Here we can see we have antigen in excess, so we're going to remain in uh, solution. And then we're going to deposit when we get to uh, perhaps our glomerulus or our synovium. And where we deposit, we're going to get a complement uh, activation. And this is going to result in immune complex mediated inflammation and tissue injury. And in this particular example, we can see a vasculitis as we get platelets and neutrophils and neutrophil lysosomal enzymes. And this brings us again to this image. Now, instead of focusing on a good pasture uh, syndrome here, we're going to focus on our lupus nephritis here, where you can see this granular appearance. So why does it look granular when we have immune complex uh, deposition? It's because this is a purely random uh, process. So wherever that immune complex uh, happens to embed in uh, the vessel, this is where it's going to light up. And we can see this here compared to this uniform deposition in good pasture disease. 
So this brings us to our final uh, type of hypersensitivity. This is type 4 or T cell mediated hypersensitivity. And the primary cell type we're talking about here is CD4 positive T cells. There uh, is a minor contribution uh, from CD8 positive T cells. So let's focus on our CD4 positive T cells that will be elaborating cytokines. And it's these cytokines that are going to lead to inflammation. Now, this is also referred to as delayed type hypersensitivity because it tends to occur 24 to 48 hours after exposure to your antigen. And the way to remember this is through something we've all experienced in medical school is our uh, tuberculosis test, our PPD, our purified protein derivative. So they take an antigen, they inject it under your skin, and they tell you, go away for 24 to 48 hours, then come back and we'll see if there's induration. If there's induration, that's because you have delayed type uh, sensitivity and we have our Th1 cells activating macrophages, our Th17 cells activating neutrophils. So that is uh, cell-mediated hypersensitivity. So I already mentioned the tuberculin reaction. We can also see this in rheumatoid arthritis, which has a bonus type 3 hypersensitivity thrown in, as well as drug reactions. Now, I said that CD8 positive T cells are thought to also play a role in this by direct uh, cytolysis, uh, and it's thought they may play a role in type 1 diabetes, and I'll show you an incredible example of that. So let's look here again at a figure from Robinson Kumar Basic Pathology. Uh, you can see here we have our CD4 positive T cell, which is uh, responding to this uh, tissue antigen presented uh, by this antigen presenting cell. We can get differentiation along Th1 or Th17 uh, lineages. The Th1 effector cells are going to generate uh, their interferon gamma, stimulated in our macrophages along the classical activation pathway that are going to cause inflammation and tissue damage. What our Th17 effector cells will do is elaborate IL-17, which will recruit and activate neutrophils, again causing inflammation and tissue damage. Now with our CD8 positive T cell mediated cytolysis, we have again our uh, CD8 positive T cell recognizing this uh, presented antigen and then uh, binding to uh, the self cell either uh, an antigen that's uh, displayed by uh, an infected cell with a microbe or uh, a self protein. Uh, and then we will get our preformed mediators and cell uh, killing and injury. All right, so here is an example of delayed type hypersensitivity. This is a skin biopsy. So this could be, for example, uh, poison ivy. So someone who uh, was uh, previously exposed to poison ivy uh, and now has had their second exposure. If you were to do a biopsy, you can see here uh, this uh, perivascular um, inflammatory infiltrate. Now at this point in your medical career, you're like, oh, those could be anything. Fortunately, we can do immunohistochemistry, which is going to recognize that these are CD4 positive T cells. So this is our delayed type hypersensitivity. Now keep in mind that if we have a persistent uh, uh, infection, for example with tuberculosis, and this is a granuloma seen in the lung of an individual with tuberculosis, here we have our epithelioid uh, macrophages that are being stimulated by the interferon gamma that's being produced by our CD4 positive T cells. So this is again a type of hypersensitivity. And then I alluded already uh, once to rheumatoid arthritis. This is covered in the video that compares osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. But then again, just to bring it all together so that you understand it in the context of hypersensitivity. We have our susceptibility genes, uh, our failure of tolerance, we have our environmental factors. All of this are going to cause the generation of our Th17 and Th1 cells, as well as our antibodies. And when these cells and antibodies enter the joint, we're going to get the release of proteases and cytokines, as well as the deposition of immune complexes, so type 3, as well as uh, what we see here with our Th1 and Th17, type 4. And all of this together is going to result in the injury, panis formation, cartilage damage, and bone damage that we see in rheumatoid arthritis. Now, I did promise you we would look at something related to CD8 positive uh, T cells in type 4 hypersensitivity. This is an incredible image showing an islet of Langerhans in the pancreas, and it is being infiltrated by these CD8 positive T cells that are going to kill these cells, and eventually this patient will develop a type 1 diabetes. So as always, here are some questions for you to review the material that you've just uh, seen. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you have found this useful.